Ladies and gentlemen, this is an unusual press conference. There are five leaders in New York City who asked to come up and visit with me and visit with the legislative leaders about the narcotics program. Life sentence for pushers. The reason we're late in coming in here is because these gentlemen have been talking and answering questions uh, with the leaders of both houses, majority and minority, and the chairman of the committees. They'll be dealing with this subject. I would like to call on each one of these five gentlemen. Three are ministers, one a civic leader, and one a doctor. All of them have been involved with the problem of drugs for a lifetime. I don't think that it would be possible to find five more knowledgeable people from the street point of view. Now, first, I'd like to call on Reverend Dempsey, who has a church on 125th Street in Manhattan, and who has spent 27 years, long before any of the rest of us, became aware of or concerned with this tragic scourge which has now spread to our entire nation and is taking the lives, literally taking the lives of thousands of people every year and destroying the lives of hundreds of thousands. After these five gentlemen have spoken briefly, then we'll go to questions and general discussion. So first I'd like to call on the Reverend Dempsey one of the really longtime fighters in the cause of human dignity, Reverend Dempsey. Governor Rockefeller, Governor Wilson, Attorney General Lefkowitz, ladies and gentlemen of the press and legislative leaders. We are from Harlem and from other ghettos in the city of New York. And so we've come today because we felt that we had a right to come that a great moral issue is involved. I have seen the nation's number one state, New York, become a state of fear for more than 18 million law-abiding citizens. And I personally understand the deeper meaning of this proposed legislation. Dope pushers made this so. 75 to 80 percent of the crimes committed in our state's largest city are committed by drug addicts against law-abiding citizens. All of these hardships can be laid at the doors of the hard drug pushers, the slave masters of addicts. I was assaulted by members of a dope mob in April of 1971. Lester Hines here has been assaulted many times. Dr. Beard has been attacked. And we know what it is like to be victimized by bloodthirsty, money-hungry, death-dealing criminals. And that's why we are here today. I want you to know that all non-addict hard drug pushers know that as long as we have weak and inadequate machinery in law enforcement and in our criminal justice systems, no anti-drug program will succeed. We've tried many programs in the state of New York. Many programs were tried because people were sincere. The state was sincere. But as long as these pushers realize that the machinery to deal with them is inadequate. The programs will not succeed. That is one reason why I know that Governor Rockefeller's proposed legislation dealing with the addict and non-addict hard drug pusher must be passed 
at once. The decision now rests with our state senators and our assemblymen. May God give them the courage and strength to act and act wisely. It is true that many professionals, some politicians, civil libertarians and sympathizers, and even some jurists view this proposed legislation as unrealistic. None addict hard drug pushers themselves will wail about their rights being violated. But unfortunately, not much is ever said or done about the victims who have in so many cases lost their lives, making their rights null and void. At least the life sentence gives the defendant a chance to live. Thousands and thousands of non-addict hard drug pushers, victims didn't have that chance. Finally, there is no punishment as harsh and as unjust and as brutal as the punishment being meted out against you, me, our children, and our state by non-addict and addict hard drug pushers. I pray and trust that this legislation will be passed in a hurry and that it will be implemented to the teeth. Thank you very much. Ladies and gentlemen, you've heard a man who has deep feelings. Next, I'd like to call on Reverend Earl Moore, who is one of the rising leaders in the Baptist community. And he is representing Reverend Sandy Ray, who wanted to be here, but who was slightly indisposed and therefore could not come. As you know, Saint Reverend Sandy Ray has been head of the Baptist organization nationally. And so I present to you Reverend Earl Moore. Thanks, Ray. You come down. The Governor Rockefeller to the ladies and gentlemen of the press. We come today believing that our governor, our chieftain, bears the mark of a hero. He bears the mark of a hero because he has stood on the wall of our state. He has stood on the walls of our homeland and he has seen the preponderance of failure, of doom and devastation. And as he stands there, he has done something that is very hard to do and that is to admit failure from all of the other programs that we've tried. But we believe today that he has taken on a, an, a heroic nature because he has seen a new hope because we have exhausted all other sources and we have come to demand that our legislators we've come to demand that they will support that they will back up this legislation so that the people of this waste howling wilderness the people of this land of desolation, the mothers of the land, the children of the land, the fathers of the land from whence I come, may once again be able to walk towards the omega point of hope, that the children who go to school every day in fear and trepidation, that even the little allowances that they have will have to be given up that they will be able to walk into our school rooms and know that it is here once again that they can become susceptible to develop that which God has given to them, the highest gift to mankind. We have come to say to our governor and to say to those who have been elected to represent us that the time is Past. The time was yesterday, for if we do not do anything today about what has happened yesterday and today, there will be no tomorrow.
Thank you very much, Reverend Moore. Now I'd like to call on Mr. Hines, who is the head of the People's Civic and Welfare Association in Harlem, a man who knows this problem firsthand from everyday living, Mr. Hines. Governor Rockefeller, <coughs> members of the legislature, and the press. I'm here today because I feel that the governor needs support, and the legislature should give him that kind of support to protect the people of our state. We need to save the young people. The young people are dying. Occasionally, when a prominent citizen is mugged, robbed, or burglarized, makes the headlines. But there are people dying, young people are dying every day in my community. There's nothing is said about them. They're dying because of the distributors and the pushers who are merchants of debt. The time has arrived that something must be done. The state of New York, with a courageous governor, spent a billion dollars with all kinds of treatments, yet nothing has happened. We see young men standing like this all around in the streets of the neighborhood, blinded from drugs, yet the pushers and the distributors are making a fortune. We must call a halt to it now. Tomorrow is too late. Today is the day. Our young people are dying. They are being destroyed. And unless, unless you back this bill, which is uh, not going far enough in supporting the governor, I say, New York State is doomed, not only the state of New York, because all the other states are watching to see what New York is doing. And unless we surpass this bill and you take immediate action, Mr. Legislators, it means that thousands of children before 1973 out will be in the cemetery. And no one will know about it, only becomes another statistic. I thank you. Mr. Hines, thank you very much. And now, Reverend McMurray of the AME Zion Church in New York and head of the AME Zion Church nationwide, another man who has devoted his life to this tragedy. Mr. McMurray. Reverend McMurray, thank you. Thank you, Governor Rockefeller and Lieutenant Governor. Uh, our Attorney General, Mr. Lefkowitz, and members of the press. I'm here because of my deep concern uh, from this particular point of a mo as a moral issue. It is true that I am from Harlem. I work in, in Harlem, and I love people. But this has become, I think, a little bigger than Harlem. The drug problem is our number one enemy in America. And I want to commend the governor for taking this forthright stand and giving us uh, some platform upon which to stand now and uh, come to grips with this uh, cancerous uh, problem, which is eating away the very fabrics of our democracy. Now, when you send a few men to prison, I think we're about to panic. When you send a few men to prison for life, someone's going to pass the word down. It's not too good over here. So I, my, my, my motive will change. My incentive will change. Instead of robbing and selling dope, I want to go to school and to live a good life and to make a good and productive citizen. And then we are pleading to the legislators and those who are in high places. Don't play politics with lives. Don't play games with our young people. 
If you want to be a politician, be a real politician. Get out here and tell it like it is and help us save our society. Governor Rockefeller has done a, a beautiful job. But money is not your problem now. You have billions. What you need now, uh, you need men of goodwill, men who will come forward to the front and help us to solve this grave problem. All of us who are here today, I don't have any children, someone may say, but don't you know if you have a boy or a girl, you may be the victim this evening of a heartbreak. It's just that bad. Dope has become a crisis. You tell me you love America when you peddle this deadly weapon on the street? How can you love it? How can you love me when you're destroying my very soul? Support the governor. Any, any kind of law can be amended. Anything can be amended, but nothing. If you have no law to amend, you can't amend it. Pass it like it is, and with your good mind, with your know-how and skills, certainly, you can amend the law. But whatever you do, stick by the government because this can well be a model program for the country. We need men now of goodwill and moral leadership. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Reverend McMurray. Now, ladies and gentlemen, I want to present a doctor, a very unusual doctor. He has a practice in Harlem, and he has a practice on Park Avenue. He's been in practice in Harlem for 20-some years, along with Reverend Dempsey. I think that probably Dr. Baird and Reverend Dempsey know this problem firsthand better than any other individuals in our community. And therefore, it's with great pleasure that I give you Dr. Robert Baird. Thank you very much, Governor. Who turns on a drug addict? It's another drug addict who's dealing, who's on junk, and he says, hey, Joe, why don't you take heroin and turn on with me and find out what a great, cool feeling it is. And he turns on the kid. It's not me in the organized crime with the silk suit who's waiting outside a schoolyard turning on kids. It, that works in TV shows, but that's not the way it works out in the streets of Harlem or in the very elite Scarsdale. It's another kid who turns him on. And it's this guy who is responsible for some of these statistics. Those of you that are sort of protected from the world of reality. Do you know we've got 2,000 deaths in New York City from heroin, from drugs? Are you aware that we've got 2,000 newborn babies addicted to heroin? Are you aware that we just had 2,000 homicides in New York City? We also get the nonsense by our commissioner of police that there's been a decrease in crime in New York City. We've had, just, just give you, throw out a couple statistics, 210,000 burglaries, 2,600 rapes, 110,000 automobile thefts, 163 grand larcenies, and then something that everyone forgets is 36,000 aggravated assaults. That means where they beat the living daylights out of you, either with a gun or a knife. And then something that is now swept under the carpets in New York is that any crime of $1,500 and less is not to be reported as a statistic. Well, I dare say, who in this group even considering Governor Rockefeller with that kind of money doesn't miss $1,500. That's a hell of a lot of money, and it should be reported. Because in Harlem, that means four rooms. That means a bedroom, a kitchen, a living room, and a dining room. That's what it means to us in the Harlem community. I think what should be done so we can help the Bleeding Heart Society, particularly the American Civil Liberties Union, which I got a better word for them, America can lose you. They're worried about the kid. American can lose you, that's what I said. I would like the governor to mount a campaign on press, TV, radio, buses, cars, cabs, saying, do not push drugs. And this should be a three-month campaign out in the multilingual papers, Yiddish, Spanish, Italian, and English, and say that, do not push drugs, because if you do, you are facing life 
imprisonment. We got to dispel the myth which has unfortunately come down by so many psychiatrists that the drug addict is a sick creature. There's so many psychiatrists suffer from a syndrome, and my brother's a shrink, in which I call paralysis by analysis. They're analyzing the kids till they know when the kid went to the party at two years old, but they fail to realize that drug addict is totally aware of what he is doing. When he mugs an old individual, why doesn't he take a man on like me? Why does he always take on a defenseless old lady or old man? If he doesn't know what he's doing, how come he puts a pin or a toothpick in the door, jams it up, so when you come home at night, you start playing around with the doorknob, which clues him, let him bounce out the rear window. If he's so unstable, how does he know to take a $5,000 negotiable bond in New York City and off it for $100? If he is so non mentis, how does he know to jam an elevator so that after he's robbed you, that you can't get out of that elevator and he can make it down the stairs. They are totally aware of what they're doing, but the bleeding hearts have said they don't know what they're doing. Yet, just you as men and women in this audience, what would you do with a rapist or a zodomist who grabs hold of your kid? Do you send this fellow to the hospital? Like hell you do. You send him right to prison. So if I've inspired you a little bit to get the other part of the story, give the people who have died, give them a break. The drug addict, when he pulled the trigger or pressed the knife into their belly, he became judge, jury, prosecuting attorney, and legal aid society attorney all in one foul swoop. And the guy that's down there can't get a bargaining plea that he can come back and live his life fulfilled. Put that in your pipe, make sure it's got no pot, and smoke it. What about the role of corrupt officials? Oh yeah, this has been this has been pulled till the cows come home, maligning the cops that the cops are the guys that are pushing in Harlem. You take thirty-five thousand cops, and if you get three percent that are bad, that's a thousand cops, which makes a hell of a lot of cops. But I'll give you a room. You give me a thousand priests, a thousand rabbis, a thousand ministers, and out of that group, you show me three guys that haven't played around with any other woman, and I'll tell you, you've got the same thing going for them. The same thing is with the cops. You've got a few bad ones, but the majority of the cops are great guys. But what happens? They make an arrest, they bring it up to a damn judge, and he says, illegal search and seizure on the kid. It was above cause. And with the result, what do they do? That kid is busted in the morning. He's in the judge in the afternoon. And the nighttime, he's out in the street putting his finger up to the cop on the block, which makes him a hero. Until you can get judges that have got an adequate amount of male hormone going through there hernias, then you'll have a chance to get this type of tough approach. How do we get organized crime? What we're doing is getting their puppets, right? Well, well now you've got to think, what, what's holding us back with organized crime? You've got wiretapping that we can't use on them, which we should be. Everyone's worried about the constitutional rights of organized crime. But what about the cops? We can't use it, but organized crime could put a tap all the time us, on us. What about illegal search and seizure? You can't, if you're suspicious of a guy and you toss his house, and the fact that you only got a pound of heroin and you didn't put in your bill of particulars a half a pound of coke, the half a pound of coke is suppressed as evidence until we can get legislators to say, whatever you go into that house, and if you pick up this guy with dope, you prosecute. And I give them the fancy example that was reported in one of our leading newspapers. A guy came off a ship was somewhere in the vicinity of 17 kilos of stuff. He was arrested by a suspicious agent. The case was thrown out of court. Why? Illegal search and seizure. We give them every damn right, but we don't protect the citizen with the right to live. So is hashish and amphetamines. Would you include that under the definition you've given them? Oh, yeah, because you see, amphetamine addicts are very nasty guys. The several times I've been attacked have not been by people on heroin. I nearly was stabbed by a, uh, not to have to grab hold of him and dump him, it was an amphetamine addict, and the one that broke my hand was a barbiturate addict, a girl, a, a kid, 110 pounds. Stone came out behind me and snapped my hand and broke it. And there it is. No, it's the same thing, because kids can get strung out on uh, barbiturates. Kids die from an overdose of barbiturates. Kids die from an overdose of amphetamine. They go into congestive heart failure, they develop small hemorrhages in the brain. 
amended to put barbiturates in it? I think it's already in there if you go and read the second paragraph. See? Second paragraph, he starts off with hashish, then he goes amphetamines, uh, barbiturates, LSD. Read it very carefully, because I read it before I come up there. I do my homework, just like a teacher. Hashish. Of course, and hashish is used in India and China as a mild uh, analgesic agent to do surgery. And if you can stone someone out, if you had an abscess in the back of the hand, as brave as you would be, I'm sure you'd say to your doctor, infiltrate with procaine, I don't want to feel it. They take hashish, they can go out of their mind. And I brought this up in the uh, armed services, congressional hearings of kids that were on hashish. Imagine they saw VCs coming, opened up their guns, gave our position away on the Ho Chi Minh Trail, and they moored it in on our boys. And this is in the testimony before the armed services committee. Uh, legislators and leaders of some of Goy's reservations, some have gone as far as calling your uh, your pr proposition uh, draconian. Uh, what do you see the chances of this passing right now? Well, obviously this is a very emotional situation. Uh, you don't have five men come as these men have done, who come from the life of our community and speak the way they have if they don't feel it awfully strongly in their hearts and in their minds. We had a very interesting session with the legislators this morning, and I think that most of those who are dealing with laws and uh, dealing with the criminal justice system and so forth uh, in terms of the framework of laws don't have the opportunity to see what these men see and experience every day. And therefore, you hear the judges talk about overcrowding of the court. We've got to have plea bargaining because we can't keep the calendar clear or that we've got this problem or that problem. This is understandable from their point of view, but how about society? How about the victims? How about protecting our people? And if we say we've got to keep the calendar clear by putting the victims back, I mean, the, the uh, criminals out on the street, that's an admission of defeat of our society. I can't admit that. And as I think the legislators begin to see this thing in its full ramifications, I think they're going to take a somewhat different point of view. I have one goal, one objective, and that is to stop the pushing of drugs and to protect the innocent victim. I think our focus, and I've been part of this act, and when uh, Dr. Beard says he couldn't get to me, that's right. I was on this kick of trying to get the addict off the street into treatment and on the theory that if we got them all off the street into treatment, there'd be nobody to buy the drugs and therefore the pushers would go away. Now this was a beautiful concept, except it just didn't happen to relate to the realities because the pushers keep finding new people. And therefore, well, one, and number two, that those who are addicted are not crazy about going into treatment. So that um, the changes we're making in the law on treatment this or at least I've recommended will help on that side and I want just as sincerely as in the past to get every addict into treatment. Now, I have to say that as far as I am aware there is no known absolute cure for addiction and therefore we find ourselves in a position of continuing treatment and the intensive care treatment we were giving was costing $11,000 per addict per year. So that you get a little feel of the size of this problem if our approach is just to try and cure or take care of the people who are addicted. And therefore, we've got to have the courage to say, let's go to the source, let's stop the pushing. And we have gotten, we've gone through a period of where, because we're a very humane, kind, wonderful people, we see the, the tragedy in the lives of a great many of the addicts and addict pushers, and so we tend to sympathize. But I think the time has come to focus on those who are not yet hooked, who are going to be hooked, who will either die, whose lives will be destroyed. And we've got to save those people. And I think when the legislators face this situation, they've got to come 
to the facing of this hard reality, and how do we accomplish it? Now, this is an answer to your question. What amendments? Of course, the leg I propose the legislature disposes. Therefore, they have the right to change. But what I'm hoping is that whatever change, if any, they make, will be fully and totally aware of this one objective, how do you stop pushing? What deterrent is there that makes a young person or a professional say, this risk isn't worth it? And therefore, I will get out of this business and go to something else. And if he's an addict pusher, let's hope that he will go and get treatment. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. I'd like to thank these gentlemen who've come here today for their courage and their dedication.